Coming up on TechZilla, the return of the Commodore 64 SSD update, an Antex and Ant Chimpy is back, flat HDMI cables, a shiny new projector, and how not to work on your notebook. So close that case and get the air cleaner, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by Netflix. Go to netflix.com slash techzilla to get a free trial membership. Gamefly and West Host, offering premium web hosting since 1998. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to TechZilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or why donuts are a delicious treat from heaven, well, <laughs> we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down <laughs> someone who does. Yummy, yummy glazed. Oh my goodness. It's a little late for April Fool's, so it must be true that there's a new Commodore 64 and it supports Blu-ray. No, I'm not kidding. That even a little bit. The New York Times reported that CommodoreUSA.net will be shipping a Commodore 64 replica case stuffed with a dual-core Atom CPU. Uh, equipped with the NVIDIA ION2 graphics, DVI, HDMI out, a DVD drive, optional Blu-ray. I'm not quite sure how well uh, Blu-ray is going to play with the Ubuntu 10.4 disc uh, that is shipped in the box, not even pre-installed. There's even a tie-in for the Commodore 64 with Disney's Tron Legacy, because they both came out originally in the same year, or at least advertising for the new Commodore 64 somewhere on the DVD and Blu-ray versions of the new movie. One big note on this, though, Commodore OS 1.0, along with emulation functionality and classic game package. Actually, let me, let me read this note as it comes on the website at the bottom. Note, Commodore OS 1.0, along with emulation functionality and classic game package, will be mailed to the purchasers when available. In the meantime, units come with the Ubuntu 10.04 LTS operating system on CD ready to install. And apparently they also, uh, by the way, that basically means you're not getting the Commodore OS when it ships. You're getting the OS later in the hardware now. They've also got some VIC-20-ish computer and a keyboard offerings. Uh, figure 250 to $900 for the new Commodore 64. Nostalgia in a box. Yeah. I guess. You know, I, I think there's a young man who's going to carry one home on his uh, single-speed vintage fixed bicycle in the back of the room. Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, I think I still have my Atari 400 with its modified keyboard, and I think I upgraded it to all of 48K of I've... memory from its 16K of memory. And it's still, it's starting to rust, actually. <laughs> Computers that rust, go figure. Anyway, <laughs> speaking Computers of backing up storage, uh, storage newsletter says that Apple ordered 12 petabytes, that's 12,000 terabytes of storage for hosting iTunes video from Isilon Systems. Yeah. That's a lot of, that's a big amount of storage. So. I wonder what they're getting with it. Either they, like, I just wonder if they're, I just want to know what that's going to be used for. Hopefully redundancy <laughs> and, and it, distributing that source so anybody anywhere can get it quickly. Or maybe we're finally going to find out what they bought when they bought that company that does the thing. Oh, From the sense we can't seem to go wireless, maybe we need just one big honking cable department. Patently, Apple found a 2009 patent for a, quote, hybrid display port slash USB 3.0 adapter, which could probably include Intel's new Thunderbolt tech with a little bit of engineering twisting. And it's apparently even thinner than the current 30-pin dock connector on current iOS devices, which means there may be one port to rule them all and on your desk bind them in the near future for your Macintosh. I have no problem as long as the standard's based, you know, as long as we yes. can agree to something that, you know, it's not just a one-off or one-time or one season. It's the standard of Steve's and Jonathan Ives. I, I, I'm almost there, though. Almost there. <laughs> not quite. Apparently, Apple also has some I mean, basically, it's a collection of patents, so go check them out on the site if you're looking for a little bit of amusement. Meanwhile, Netflix, and we should point out Netflix not only is used by everybody on staff, but is a sponsor of Techzilla. Their efforts to own the best content deals in the streaming, well, they march on. They just scored streaming rights to all seven seasons of Mad Men. I haven't quite figured out if that means Mad Men will disappear from iTunes sometime this summer when it shows up on Netflix. And I'm really curious how Netflix is 75 to 100 million compares to Mad Men's earnings from the iTunes store and probably from AMC, because Lionsgate produces Mad Men. They sell the online rights to AMC, I guess. And then they're basically, they're going to show up on Netflix. So Netflix is battling to have all of the cool content. I, I want to see more content. I mean, not only from Netflix, but also mm -hmm. from other providers like Vudu. I mean, I've currently, I can get that on my PlayStation 3, and that's one of the best looking streaming services I've ever used, yeah. period. And 
I just like to see more content, particularly TV shows, episodic mm -hmm. shows, being able to get that all in one place and be able to start at the beginning and not have a disc missing in that content either <laughs> or, or a season missing for some contractual reason. Right. It's nice when they can just, just give me what I want. I'm willing to pay for it legally. It's just, everyone can make some money off this. They just need to play yeah, nice. Well, I mean, but some people want more money than others. That's true. And you have I mean, to, they're try, hopefully they're just trying to negotiate for good deals. I'm sure if Netflix drew a large enough <laughs> check, they could the get Brinks everything. Truck. They just wouldn't be able to afford it. Hey, it's also hard to geek out on overclocking if you can't find the parts. Aaron writes in, hello Patrick, I've been considering water cooling for my build lately and was wondering where I could purchase the water blocks. I searched on Newegg and found a very slim selection available. Do you know of any reputable sites to purchase the blocks? Thanks, signed Aaron. Well, well, high performance air coolers can be tough to find local if you don't have a really great computer shop in your area. We have a few here in the Bay Area that are just, we have to have many yeah. here in the Bay Area to choose from, which are great. Uh, liquid cooling gear is, I'd say, downright impossible to find in most local computer shops. Yeah, it's just, it just there's, you, part of the reason New Newegg and Tiger Direct don't have a massive selection of water cooling gear, and they still have a lot when you, when you, when you start looking at all of the individual you know, tubing and, and connectors and stuff. Um, the truth is, it's just not nearly as popular as air cooling, and it doesn't offer as many advantages as it did over air cooling in the past. Um, but you're gonna need a water block, a pump, radiator tubing, joints and clamps, maybe a VGA cooler or chipset coolers. You can pick up the tubing and the clamps at a decent local hardware store, although stainless steel clamps may not fit the aesthetic of the interior of your computer. It's kind of a pain in the ass, pardon my language, unless you go with a pre-assembled uh, sealed style kit like Corsair's Hydro 870, which you can pick up. That's just going to do the CPU, but for 105, 110 bucks online, if you can replace a fan and a heat sink, you can install that. Uh, and not as, as, uh, <laughs> as Kyle from Hard OCP and I were discussing about, he, as he put it, if you install water cooling on, 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 just eventually you will have the accident. Oh, really? You know what I mean, it will happen. That one time um, you want to swap out a new part or something and you have to take the tube out. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's water, it's a PC. <laughs> they don't go well together. That's why the sealed kits are kind of nice. They, they keep That's, the water inside. Unless, I agree. You know, Conan rips them apart. Um, and I got to say, the last time I, I got a really full zoot water cooling set put together, I ended up dropping almost $300 in parts. So, if I haven't dissuaded you, uh, look, Newegg and, and Tiger Direct are a good place to start, but you really need to check out frozencpu.com. They've got the Cool Girl blocks from EK Supreme and Heat Killer and like four or five other manufacturers, tubing fittings, radiators. It, it's, it's the mother load for liquid cooling. They also, by the way, stock a ton of PC parts, an amazing collection of air coolers at great prices, and I really did not need to see the Lian Lee PC343B module aluminum case, which can hold, brace yourselves, eight Teen five and a quarter inch optical drives. This could be the new home for the Rip Monster 3000. Ooh. Ooh. Eight teen optical drives in one case. I don't need that many optical drives, but I <laughs> am about to build, I think, a NAS box finally. Just break down and do it and use some of the old hardware I'm recycling. And I just need the right case, though, that'll hold all these hard drives and it looks okay. And I know Lan Lee has plenty of I'm them. I'm so. doing some cool stuff with Free NAS. When I finish setting that up, I will let you know. Awesome. We will be ready. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, West Host. They've been around for a while, people. We're talking about premium web hosting since 1998. Affordable plans that started just 19 cents a day. Free US-based support so you understand the person at the other end of the phone. And hey, they're available 24-7 by phone, chat, and email. One click installs hundreds of apps and they'll even transfer your current web hosting, well, your website from your current web hosting for free and you get a 60-day money-back guarantee and great service performance. You don't like it, you can leave without paying any money. Do yourself a favor, visit westhost.com slash techzilla. If you're thinking about moving to a new web provider, you'll get an exclusive 25% discount off for web hosting. Support Techzilla by supporting our sponsors like westhost.com slash techzilla. Hey, it's time to get our HD Nation on. The Samsung D8000, I saw one here in the Revision 3 offices. Uh, I, I, that was bad to have one just sitting there, just <laughs> tempting me. It's also sitting in my current shopping cart on Amazon.com. So. And the price has gone down like 500 bucks. Yeah. I, it's just do it, dude. Way tempting. Just do it. You watch anything on TV? Oh, um, <laughs> I've actually been spending more time trying to figure out the mounting on on the new projector more than anything else. Um, I need to come over and take a look at that room, just so I can visualize it better. <laughs> you're going to look at that room and you're just going to be like, this is awful. Um, gosh, what have we been watching? I've been watching way too much Wonder Pets with my son, which uh, is a really good way to, to 
put together, watching children's SD programming on iTunes is a great way to put together a list of compression errors that people should watch out for before shipping uh, product to uh, iTunes for hosting. That, it, Although you, it's not as bad as some I've seen where they didn't actually, um, where they didn't actually de-interlace standard deaf content. That's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's really irritating, especially if you paid for a season and then you find out especially that it's not Especially if that's being released. broadcast in progressive format too, because that's like pretty much burned into the video and you need a really good video processor to unrip all that apart and refix yeah. it. And, and you know, and there's no sort of de-interlacing button uh, on the Apple TV. So fortunately, oh. fortunately this is one of the not horrendously encoded shows, but it's not one of the best encoded shows either. It's a little, I mean, it's frustrating. I feel your pain. I've been, uh, I've been just sitting in front. Last weekend I spent watching the MotoGP race in, mm -hmm. in Spain, and it was raining the entire time during the race, and I must, that was the most exciting racing I have seen in so long. I watched it three People times. sliding off the side of the track. Uh, that was part of it, but it just, it, it just kept it exciting throughout the right. entire match. And yeah, it was raining, it was tough riding, and sure, some people dumped their equipment, and, and you look at the price of those bikes too, they really don't get into how much those things cost, but A millions, lot. millions of dollars. <laughs> but that was just some of the best motorsports I've seen in a long time. And uh, F1's coming up this week, so it's like race two in the season. I'm, I'm golden for a little while. <laughs> a bunch of you have asked about, do we trust Mono Price's uh, brackets for hanging stuff? I actually just bought their, quote, ceiling bracket for projector. They didn't spend any money on that day. 1248 <laughs> for the projector mount itself. Goes up to 44 inches from the ceiling. 1092 if you buy 50 or more. And one of their uh, flat HDMI cables. I got a 25-foot flat HDMI cable for 22 bucks in my efforts to try to get the HDMI cable under the carpet because I don't want to drill any holes in the floor nice in the nice move. craftsman home. I'm actually looking to get, uh, I need an RF cable that's flat if possible, a coax style. Ooh. I think that, that should be available. I'm run, currently running one under a carpet and you can barely see that little hump and it's just like, I can, I can get rid of that, I think. You could use thicker padding on the carpet. That's true. I don't, I don't own any of that, so I'm not trying to <laughs> change it too much. But That's anywho, <laughs> Samsung says that Samsung makes the home 3D experience more affordable than other. How? Well, <laughs> they're now including two pairs of their 3D active glasses with their new HD TVs. Better yet, an extra pair of glasses will cost less than $50. Hopefully other manufacturers will follow the lead. Uh, I, have a, I have, I think, one 3D movie at home, but I don't have a 3D <laughs> TV yet. So. The nice thing is, I think that Samsung's responding to some of the pressure they're feeling, right. maybe from some of the new passive 3D technology TVs that are coming out right now that feature relatively inexpensive glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that they usually include like four pairs in the box. Is there a decent passive HDTV for 3D at this point? I think the new Vizios that are out right now represent some of the best out there. And right. LG, which they're using LG panels, but LG is also starting to ship theirs as well. I would look to them to be the current leaders in the passive technology because I mean, they also, if you look at the product lineup, actually, they offer mm -hmm. both technologies, which is still a little confusing right now because uh, if you want passive 3D, make sure you're really paying attention to what it says on the box or in the ad that you're looking at because oh. both companies currently do kind offer. offer both. They are offering both, depending on most plasmas. I think all plasmas right now are active. So if you're looking at plasma versus LCD, there's one differentiator for the whole to-do. 3D is such a moving target because Toshiba actually says they, they swear that they will introduce a glasses-free 3D TV in the next 12 months. Ooh. I expect we will see a prototype at CES 2012 in January. Yep. We, yeah. I think they showed us a prototype at this year, but it was a... Well, I should a, say a prototype for a model they actually expect to ship. With a model than, number. There's the key. Rather than a prototype <laughs> in a room so people can go, oh, I saw 3D without glasses. <laughs> it's actually, you always see 3D without glasses. <laughs> Just this time it was filtered through an HD TV. Hey, speaking of projectors, Right in front of us here, we're finishing up our review of a trio of front projectors, and this time around we have the JVC DLA-X3 Precision front projector. $4,500 list price for three-chip design that uses JVC's Direct Drive Image Light Amplification, or DILA for short. Uh, DILA, like DLP, it's reflective technology, but instead of the fast-tilting micromirrors that make up the pixels in a DLP-based display, DLA systems feature a layer of liquid crystal on top of the silicon structure that's used to modulate the light. You might hear it termed uh, liquid crystalline silicon. And this three-chip design basically processes the red, the blue, and green light separately, eliminating the need for a spinning color wheel that single-chip projectors require. Now, that means no rainbow artifacts. If you're sensitive to that, three-chip designs eliminate that altogether. Also, the lack of a color wheel means uh, more light from the lamp module reaching the screen and eventually to your eyes. 
And that extra brightness comes in handy uh, when you consider that the X3 has 3D capability. Actually includes a nifty pair of glasses and an emitter. These are active technology. We were just talking about that. These are the liquid crystal shutter glasses to provide full 1080p resolution to both eyes. Pretty nice. Actually, I'm going to put these on over my glasses just so I can see. Actually, I can't see anything when I put those on. But <laughs> that is a fascinating look. Fascinating. Uh, basically, uh, the likes on this particular projector, I have to admit, it is, it is a technology-packed design. Includes motorized uh, horizontal and vertical lens shifting, focus, and zoom. All three of those are basically mechanically controlled using the backlit remote. Uh, very nice. It means you can stand by the screen while you're making adjustments, and that's something that is really good, especially when you're doing things like focus and getting the screen to fit just right, or getting the image to fit just right on the screen. Uh, the benchmark results I collected by the recently updated SpectraCal Calman software suite revealed that out of the box, the X3 is really optimized for a bright picture or a room with some low levels of ambient light. The X3's most consistent gamma preset, it measured right at 2.0, whereas a, a darker gamma of 2.2 is considered ideal for more home, most home theater content. Uh, 2.0 is really, again, it's, it's pushing out more light at the expense of maybe accurate image reproduction in a dark, dark room environment. Now, the X3 does provide a custom gamma setup that a professional calibrator could use to dial it in just perfect. Also, the X3's default white balance, how it mixes red, blue, and green into white, that uh, and its color gamut were both decent. However, the provided controls allowed me to tune up the white balance. It starts off a little bit cool, a little bluish, and I was able to warm it up a little bit to get it to the standard it's supposed to be. Bottom line, the X3, the JVC X3, sets uh, basically a standard for features that I expect, uh, or for price and performance and the features that it incorporates. It's, it's pretty astounding what $4,500 will get you. That sounds like a lot of money, but if you consider even a year ago, easily two or three times that cost to get, right. to get something that, A, it wasn't 3D, uh, a three-chip full projector design, and to have things like you know motorized lens shifting and all the other features that are built in. 120 hertz performance as well, if you're mm -hmm. looking to have that, if you prefer, uh, it's good for action, but right. for movies you probably wouldn't want to enable that. And I gotta say, the only thing I, I would say to that would be that I think it's more expensive siblings, the X9 and the X7, respectively. Mm -hmm. They offer even better performance in terms of contrast. The blacks are darker. Also, they offer THX certification for color and other performance. They've, they've hammered on those. That's what you get by spending a little bit more on those models compared to, say, the X3. Also, the X9 and X7 also provide some advanced color controls that I might have been able to use to further fine tune the display. Now, comparing this to, say, the digital projections SIN 230, mm -hmm. that costs a little bit more for that single chip DLP system. However, I felt that they did a better job of its out of the box performance mm -hmm. compared to where, while this costs a little bit less and has a few more bells and whistles, I had to work a little bit harder to get the picture where I wanted it. But when you see the contrast of a, a DLA-based projector like this JVC, how, how dark black is compared to right. most other projectors out there, it, it's, it's, it's eye candy at its best, <laughs> I really have to admit. It's, it's fun viewing. It's good stuff. It's actually it's been funny actually running a projector in the house to, to really start to get a handle on how much ambient light can degrade the picture on the screen. Yeah, it'll uh, a projector. Uh, it depends a lot on the screen material too. Mm -hmm. Like I'm using a very sensitive screen for testing that it, if even the slightest light in the room will bounce that hit the screen, bounce off and radiate in all directions right. pretty evenly and it will easily wash out. So it's more critical that I either use that screen in a very dark environment or, you know, just be aware of it. Yeah, well, I mean, you can still watch it with some light coming in the windows. It's just amazing when you block that light how much deeper and richer the colors get. It makes it makes it pop. And it's pop. when you can truly just you want a pitch black room if possible. That, yeah. That's the best environment for watching a projector. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and in many ways, you can exceed what's capable in movie theaters where they have to have emergency lighting and, and track lighting on the floors and all these other little distractions. And other people. You can have a completely unsafe environment in your house <laughs> with no lights whatsoever and matte black walls and make it perfect. But <laughs> Let us move on to the new Blu-ray release. Hey, now it's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of April 12, 2011. First up, The Incredibles. This 2004 film from Pixar follows a family of superheroes who have tried to settle into a so-called normal life that gets sucked back into the crime-fighting world. 
With an MPEG-4 AVC codec in the original 239 to 1 aspect ratio, Blu-ray.com gives the video quality a 4.5 out of 5, saying, quote, minor banding and nearly negligible aliasing are the only small-time criminals The Incredibles is forced to contend with. And even then, both issues are, are so fleeting and infrequent that it's barely worth mentioning, unquote. Overall, Pixar fans won't be disappointed, and they sum up saying The Incredibles look incredible. This four-disc region-free release comes jam-packed with extras, including two full commentaries, two animated shorts, 35 minutes of deleted scenes, two hours of features from the DVD release, a home theater calibration tool, and you'll even get a code for a free Cars 2 movie ticket if you're a Disney Rewards member. Next up, Le Circle Rouge. From the Criterion Collection, this 1970 French film follows a thief, an escaped murderer, and an ex-cop who team up for a jewelry heist. Directed by Jean-Pierre Melville, it's notable for its climactic action sequences, which last 25 minutes and contains no dialogue and indeed much of the film is dialogue free, which is why it makes me happy to see Criterion as the one to release this classic. This Region A locked release features an MPEG-4 ABC codec and the original 185 to 1 aspect ratio. Criterion painstakingly cleaned up the 35mm film, manually removing dirt and debris from each frame. This film comes with the original mono soundtrack, which was remastered at 24-bit from the 35mm magnetic soundtrack, with pops, clicks, and hisses manually removed for a clean audio experience. Extras on this disc include a bunch of archival footage, like a 28-minute clip from a French TV show, with Melville discussing his fascination with American films, and four other archival featurettes from French television, totaling 25 minutes. Also included is an illustrated booklet with essays and interviews. Also released this week, Sharp's Classic Collection. Sharp is a British series consisting of 16 two-hour episodes based on novels about a fictional soldier played by Sean Bean in the early 1800s. This collection includes the first 14 episodes, which aired between 1993 and 1997, while the two most recent episodes, released in 06 and 08, are not included in this collection, although they are available on Blu-ray separately. These 14 episodes are contained on seven Blu-ray discs, and the set also includes a DVD of Sharp's Legend, which summarizes the entire story told in the rest of the series. It's all encased in a nice wooden box engraved with the Sharp logo, and includes a map of Europe during the Napoleonic Wars, and a collector's edition letter opener. And as always, check out our show notes at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv for the rest of this week's Blu-ray releases. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Gamefly. Gamefly is the largest online video game rental service, offering you a choice from over 7,000 new and classic titles across all consoles and handhelds. With plans starting at $15.95 a month, Gamefly members can rent one to four games at a time and keep them for as long as they like. With no late fees, no due dates, and shipping is always free. Finish playing a game, send it back, and Gamefly will send you the next game on your list. If you love the game you're playing, Click Keep It on the Gamefly website, and the game is yours at a discounted price. Techzilla fans get a two-week free trial when they go to Gamefly.com slash Techzilla. We know solid state drives are on your mind. We get questions about them every week. What to buy? Are they worth it? And what's coming in the not-too-distant future? So we've got our favorite SSD Maven back on the show at Antech.com's Anand Shimpy. Welcome back, Anand. Thank you for having me as always. Oh, good to have you here. It's last time we spoke, Sandforce was picking up speed. They were the ones to beat. Are the, OCC Vertex 3, is that really the SSD to beat right now? Yeah, it looks like that. Um, so I previewed the Vertex 3 mm -hmm. uh, a couple months back, and it pretty much beat everything else that I got since then. Um, so I, I think the, the right way to do this is to kind of work backwards almost. Um, so pretty recently, Intel, Intel introduced the SSD 320, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually their it's their own controller. It's a three gigabit drive, so it doesn't work with um, it, it doesn't take advantage of six gigabit SATA. Um, and it, I, I kind of put it as it would have been a great drive last year. Uh, <laughs> this year, it's it's not really competitive with performance. Um, Intel's really selling it based on feature set and reliability. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually I have the drive right here. Um, Feature set, uh, one of the, the neat features of the drive is really that it has uh, real-time encryption. So everything that's written to the drive is fully 128-bit AES encrypted. Um, and if you've got a laptop uh, or a desktop maybe with uh, uh, that supports um, ATA password mm -hmm. uh, via BIOS password, you can actually set that and then that drive won't be readable unless you supply that password. Um, the, the other aspect of it is reliability. Uh, so Intel actually came out and said that, look, less than something like 0.6% of these drives will fail per year. 
Um, and uh, those are pretty decent numbers. And so far, no one else has really been able to equal those numbers. Um, so that, that was kind of one of the more recent releases. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, you know, Intel realized that it had to be competitive in the performance segment. So it came out with uh, this drive, which is the Intel SSD, uh, uh, the 510 series. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about the 510 is it doesn't use an Intel controller. Um, which was so Intel surreal. Yeah, so when they got into the SSD market uh, back in 08, they mm -hmm. said, you know, you need three things. You need a uh, controller, you need firmware, and you need NAND. Uh, now, Intel still provides the NAND for it, and they still provide the firmware, uh, but bottom line, I guess they kind of got caught off guard by how good Sandforce was, mm -hmm. so they turned to Marvell for a, a six gigabit SATA controller. Um, the drive performs pretty well. You know, I would say it's definitely in the, the top four uh, of what we've seen this year. Mm -hmm. um, and Intel's whole thing is, hey, this has gone through Intel validation, so it's going to be Intel reliable. Um, of course, that remains to be seen, but, you know, it's a, it's a pretty decent drive. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're going to keep work our way, working our way back. We've got uh, this thing right here. It's mm -hmm. Crucial's M4. Uh, it's also going under the name of the Micron uh, C400. Mm -hmm. So the M4 is an update to the C300, which was a pretty popular drive last year. Um, it's it's mostly evolutionary in terms of its update. Uh, overall performance for a light user is pretty decent, um, but it, it, it uh, when you really, really stress it with a lot of writes and a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, a heavier, more aggressive workload, uh, it kind of falls flat there. So it really depends on usage model. All the three drives I just kind of put forth uh, really, really do well in kind of your typical desktop usage scenario, which I think a lot of people will fall into. And you can't really go wrong with any of them. Uh, but of course, the, the drive you asked me about is uh, this thing here, which is the Vertex 3. Um, I actually have it open. Um, it's and, so shiny. Uh, yeah, I know it is. It's really cool. So this is actually uh, one of the first retail drives. They they actually just finished it up. OCD Vertex Three. You said four firmware revision, revisions for the retail one since the for the preview model you tested. Yeah, it's uh, it's been through four, um, and both the OCC and Sandforce have really really stressed that this time around they're taking validation and testing way more seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you an example, the drive was supposed to come out last month. Um, they delayed it because they discovered a problem in the 2011 MacBook Pros. Uh, and it, they're just they're putting us through a lot more testing than than what at least I've seen them do uh, with last year's model. Now, that's not to say that it's going to be entirely bug free, but at least for the 240 gig model. So if you're you know you're buying in that capacity range, uh, it looks like that's the drive to beat. Mm -hmm. um, where it gets a little more confusing, uh, the drive um, I've got here. So this one's actually a 120 gig model. Um, the the problem with the way SSDs work is that. Uh, they're kind of like GPUs in mm -hmm. that they, they bank on you trying to write or access a lot of data at once, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they split up that request and send it to as much NAND and as many NAND die as possible. Uh, the issue with the 120 gig drive is it's got half the number of usable dry, uh, die as the 240 gig drive, Ooh. so performance is actually lower. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, it's still <laughs> really, really good. It's just not quite as good. Where I would say the, the 240 gig drive really, really strikes me as a uh, next generation SSD, mm -hmm. uh, I would say the 120 kind of falls between what I would consider last generation and next generation. So how about, I mean, it's kind of funny, uh, OS X line is finally going to support trim, although some people have figured out some interesting hacks for making it work now. Uh, do you feel at this point like OS X users are finally going to be up to speed on SSDs? So, oh, one other thing I should mention on the Vertex mm -hmm. 3 before I tackle OS X is that it sure. also supports uh, uh, full encryption of everything written to the NAND. So the Intel 320 and the Vertex 3 both support that. Um, now, the OS X question, that's kind of a difficult one. So mm -hmm. Apple is only certifying trim on its own SSDs. And the argument that Apple offers is that basically this is a, an experience and a usage model that we can guarantee that we know is 100% compatible and no one else is really willing to offer the same sort of guarantee. Um, so I've noticed that. I've actually, you know, I've been talking to Intel, talking to a lot of these folks mm -hmm. that uh, some of their customers have problems on the new MacBook Pros. And the kind of unanimous response is, well, talk to Apple. <laughs> and, the, and Apple's unanimous response is, uh, we don't support those, so either use our, our SSDs or we can't guarantee you know, you'll necessarily have a stable usage environment. Um, I, I believe this is an 
an issue because it, it effectively means that, hey, if you want 100% guarantee that this thing's going to work, you have to buy an Apple SSD. Um, the Apple SSDs basically ship with either uh, Toshiba or Samsung uh, controllers in them. Uh, they're fine, but they're definitely not the fastest thing in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and, and neither of them are 6 gigabit, even though Apple started uh, shipping 6 gigabit uh, controllers in their MacBook Pros. So I, I feel like, yeah, it's great that we finally have trim under OS X. Um, the trim enabler, the, the hack does work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've I've heard mixed results about it. You know, it's something that I'm going to be testing here over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I, I still feel like Mac users are kind of, uh, unfortunately, we're in a, a, a very uh, sticky situation right now <laughs> where there are great drives out there, and you know, I've tested a lot of them in these systems, and they work. But I, you know, I've got tons of readers that just say, "Hey, uh, Drive X doesn't work in my MacBook Pro," and uh, there's not much I can do about that because the <laughs> controller makers and the SSD makers themselves, they won't take responsibility and, and neither will Apple. Um, and I don't really know whose fault it is. So let's see, OCC, the, basically the Vertex 3 for the, the enthusiast, Intel probably sounds like the default for the large corporation. I mean, do, at this point, it seems like everybody has their major announcements out. Do you expect any huge sort of capacity or performance bumps between now and the end of the year? Um, so the big unknown is Indolinx. Uh, mm -hmm. OCC just closed that acquisition. Um, obviously, they had controllers in the works. Uh, they, they obviously missed last generation, but mm -hmm. I, I would expect to see something from them before the end of the year. Um, and, and I also don't think Intel's entirely done either. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too surprised to see something from them as well. I, I don't expect any significant leapfrogs in performance based on, you know, if you look at the 240 gig Vertex 3, I think that's pretty much going to be the top of the line in terms of performance. We might see stuff a little bit faster, but I, I can't see a, a generational improvement this year. Um, I'd be glad to be wrong, but that's just, uh, that's just what I, my gut tells me. Um, in terms of pricing, you know, everyone's really, really ramping up uh, uh, 25 nanometer NAND or, or 2x nanometer generation stuff. Uh, so pricing can be expected to kind of fall as production ramps up, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't think we're going to be seeing that cut in half sort of uh, price reductions that we saw in the <laughs> early days of SSDs. Rats. Yeah, you're, you're lucky if you'll see maybe a quarter drop, 25% um, drop annually maybe. We've been getting a bunch of email. I'm not sure if like maybe Newegg was having a sale or something, but we've been getting a bunch of questions about Seagate from Memphis uh, XT and the whole concept. Like somebody picked up an old issue of Popular Mechanics and they found out about hybrid drives. Yeah. I mean, is the window of opportunity for the hybrid drive the combination of a big mess of, of flash memory on, on a hard drive platter? Is that pretty much past, left the station? Um, I, I believe my conclusion to our Momentus XT review was uh, I, I'd want an SSD. This isn't. This doesn't replace an SSD by any means. But if you make me have a hard drive, this is the one I want. Right? <laughs> the hybrid drive does it, it. It it does help a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, the man, the myth, the legend, Anand from Anantech.com. SSDs are his crack. If you haven't been there, go check it out. Anantech.com. They do a lot more than SSDs. Netflix, we want to thank you for being one of our sponsors. I've been using them since before they became an advertiser here at Texilla. Matter of fact, just about everybody who works at Heron. Veronica, Roger, Serafina, we're all Netflix subscribers. That makes us, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five, at least five of the 20 million members. That's the people who subscribe to Netflix, making them the world's largest subscription service, instantly streaming TV episodes and movies over the internet, and of course, sending out DVDs and Blu-rays by mail. If you're a Netflix member, you can instantly watch thousands of titles on a vast array of devices. Streaming TV episodes and movies on the Xbox 360, the PS3, the Nintendo Wii, the Roku box, Apple TV, Blu-ray players, the list could go on and on. And as a Netflix Unlimited member, you can instantly watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want for one low monthly price. It is family friendly, cheap, no late fees, no due dates. If you haven't tried out Netflix, I think you should try our free trial membership. Go to netflix.com slash techzilla, sign up now, and be sure to use that URL so they know that we sent you. Netflix.com slash techzilla. We use it, we love it, we bet you will too. I had one of those moments shopping on Amazon. Uh -oh. I want to remind everybody, before you, before you buy, remember to check, not so much with Amazon, I've got an Amazon Prime membership, okay. pretty much everything gets delivered two days for free, but um, if you go to buy something, check the shipping tag. I'm used to seeing that on eBay, 
where you'll buy something and then they'll charge you like twice the price to ship it. That but I was trying to buy like little silica gel pack to put in one of my toolboxes, right. and, and they're cheap. They're like two fifty, which is nothing. Not for the little tiny paper ones, but like an aluminum one that you can throw in the oven and redo. Oh. Two fifty seven for the for the canister, which is super low for those. Um, Four ninety nine shipping. Uh, and if you order 10 like I was about to. And they charge you the same shipping on The same shipping oh. on each one. So it was going to be like $25 for these 40 gram silica gel uh, recyclable packs with $50 for shipping. My favorite hot sauce <laughs> is the same way. Right. I want to buy one bottle and it's like, oh, but you got to buy it with shipping. Those are the items where I look locally. Somebody. Right. Use one of your scanner things, scan the UPC code on it, and see if you can find it locally so you don't have to pay the outrageous shipping on stuff like that. So be careful when you're buying. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> find yourself with a giant charge going, huh? I love hot sauce. Speaking of, of giant charges, a or few desiccant. shows ago, <laughs> a few shows ago, <laughs> stop that. A few shows ago, we mentioned that getting a business class account from Comcast is a good way to get around their data cap. Blackberry Roulette comments, quote, it would help to add that Comcast also charges you a $200 installation fee for business class with a minimum of a one-year contract. Hmm. So it's so, not for everybody. Not for everybody, but I don't know if they do the same charges on all their different sort of regions, because there's a whole lot of subdivisions true. inside of Comcast. I'll say that. So. Hey, Daniel in Seattle caught our segment on replacing notebook batteries and wrote in, I cannot begin to express the horror I endured watching Patrick open up his laptop with it still plugged in and with the battery still in place. I don't think this is setting a very good example for everyone. Still love the show, Daniel in Seattle. Hmm, I, I missed this. I think it was <laughs> actually. You doing? I, I, I think he was mistaking the HD, the, the the DVI output cable that we use to get signal off the notebook. Oh, on okay. The set what were you doing? For to a power this? cable. What were you doing to I was showing basically how you swap. It was an HP notebook, okay. and it's, which has since been beaten to death inside of the, the oh, terrible Pelican case. That incident. poor thing. Um, <laughs> yes, that poor <laughs> thing is a good way of putting it. Um, I could have sworn I shut that thing off before I removed the drive. However, oh, your hard drive swapping. Yeah, it was hard drive swapping. Uh, okay. I'm pretty sure it was. I think you saw something that, you, that was not the power <laughs> cable, but. Let me make it abundantly clear, before you work on any piece of electronics, and I mentioned it like last week talking about, you know, or the you week did. before talking That's about I was cars. so shocked. Yeah, you know, if you're working on the car <laughs> electronics, unplug the, you know, take, it, take the ground off the battery. If you're working on your notebook or your desktop PC, unplug it. If you're working on your, on your notebook, unplug it and remove the battery yeah. before. Stop the source of power before you start gonna, working on an item. Totally. You if you're going to take a screwdriver that, to a notebook, yeah. you should take the battery out, pop the plug out, or you know. take the power away from it altogether. If you have an iPhone or an iPod that's sealed, you cannot remove the battery before you work on it, but you can at least shut it down before you start tearing it apart. I think you should even do the full, if you're swapping the drive out, that might be a whole different scenario, but you should also completely shut down the notebook yes. within the operating system, I completely too. agree. Okay. I, if you're swapping the hard drive, though, well, that could just eliminate the need for that, but... I could be horribly wrong. By the way, the, the notebook ran fine after we yanked the hard drive out and, and put the other hard drive in. But I will say... Robust electronics. It, bro, bro, electronics are robo, more robust than people give them credit for. But I will say, I agree, you should always shut it down, unplug the power source before you work on it. I'm were pretty you, sure. Were you shuffling your feet really hard on the carpet and then just running over to work on <laughs> it? Don't be talking to static electricity okay. with me. <laughs> Miguel <laughs> also caught that segment, had a question about the tools I was using. What screwdriver set did Patrick use in the last episode when he replaced the hard drive from the HP laptop? I noticed he had his tools in a Pelican case. Where did you get the foam he had in the case? Um, First of all, it's not a Pelican case. It's a 17-inch uh, Craftsman, what they call a truck box, because it's designed to fit underneath a mobile tool the chest. bench chest. Yeah, the, the, it's basically designed to sit under a bench seat. Uh, a 965-117, which is available. Oh, fancy. That is the, I believe the, there it is, 965-117, the Craftsman 17-inch compact truck box for $7.99. What's in it? What's in it? This oh. is a piece of foam that was cut to fit by the people at iFixit, which if I was fancy, I would use double stick tape to attach to the lid so I wouldn't have to keep putting it back. There you go. And the screwdriver set I was holding up uh, also came from iFixit. They sent us a pile of tools. Um, and this is the 54-piece bit driver kit, cost $19.95, and basically has all the selection of random uh, security bits you might find in some of your more unusual electronic applications. 
Now those are all non-standard bits. Well, they have standard bits like hex drivers and Torx drivers okay. and stuff like that. But then they've got. Uh, but you're not going to have like micro Phillips or flatheads. No, in there there's micro Phillips. Well. Oh, okay. I mean, there's the five point bit star everything. bits. There's you know the thing they don't have like security Torx bits, um, but you can find those in a lot of places. Uh, I fix it. Also has some pretty cool stuff. The Home Tech Toolkit's twenty five bucks and has a basic selection of spudgers and screwdrivers. Spudger. Spudger. It's a plastic thing for for moving small pieces of electronics around. Okay. Spudger. It's a highly tech. I don't know huh. who invented the name Spudger, I like that but name. that is. I'm gonna uh, name my. Oh, never mind. And if you have serious tool issues and you think like Weha is the Clem de la and they are, like Weha makes amazing hand tools. Um, it's out of stock, but I fix it has the amazing professional 56 driver set, which is all jewelers type screwdrivers with a really nice handle design, uh, which is $300 for the set. But if you are, have an out of control tool addiction, it might be worth checking out. Can never have enough tools. Yes, the right tool made in the USA for the right job. Yeah, it's Actually, screwdrivers, Phillips, I find GS, having the width metrics. to match the fastener you're dealing with is really yes. important. Otherwise, you can make it ugly and well, quick. That's why you should get a decent and complete set. It basically, it's, it's cheaper to buy one of these and, than to spend a lot of time trying to find all the individual parts you just trashed or lost. Hey, and finally, <laughs> Nick has a helpful tip for Windows users. He writes, I was watching one of your ep latest episodes, and Robert Heron mentioned to hit Control-Alt-Delete and then click on the Task Manager button to get to the task manager. Well, an even faster way is to hit control shift plus escape to open the task manager directly. I tried that, that worked really well. <laughs> Just one of the many Windows shortcuts that we don't know until someone tells us. Anyhow, love the show and keep it up. Thanks, Nick. Nick, you are absolutely right. That was, um, I thought about the, con when I was saying that, I was like, wow, this is convoluted. There's gotta be some kind of <laughs> shortcut. And I didn't look it up and Nick did and Nick provided the info and sure enough, Pops right up. It's amazing. Can check my CPU usage. And Actually, Windows, what apps are running? Windows Seven is like the only time I've ever used the Windows key on a keyboard. <laughs> I'm trying to think, what else do I use it for? Not much. Come Ooh. to think of it, unless something's wrong and I'm trying to get the Start menu to pop up. Or uh, anyway, <laughs> do you have a burning tech question for us? A comment about our terrible, terrible hardware habits. Well, whether it's actually about burning tech or just a very interesting question, please send it in. Techzilla at revision3.com is the email address, or you can post it on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash techzilla. Hey, and of course, we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash techhd, and Twitter at techzilla, at Robert Heron, at Patrick Norton, at Veronica, and thank you everyone so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. These are examples of stuff. Oh, I own one of these.